All right, we are recording. Okay. So, <laughs> we can move the lock. Welcome to episode 33 of Sit and Sew Radio, a Quilt Addicts Anonymous podcast. I'm your host, Stephanie Sebane. Thank you so much for tuning in for today's episode. It's really special. We're talking with Laura McDowell Hopper again today. She is a curator at the Pick Museum for Anthropology over at Northern Illinois University. It's pretty close to where I'm at in the Quad Cities uh, on the border of Illinois and Iowa. So uh, it was a nice quick drive out there to see this great exhibit that's at the museum called Quilts and Human Rights. And it's an exhibit that has been traveling for quite some time, but they've added some more recent quilts that speak to human rights that have been made in the last couple of years. And obviously there's a lot of uh, these issues in the news still today, so it's very relevant. And it's really just a great um, interview and a great way to look at how quilters, and primarily women, are using cloth and fiber to express their feelings about the world today in art. Um, we, in addition to the interview with Laura, we also have an excerpt from Reverend Jesse L. Jackson Sr., who spoke at the opening of the exhibit. He spoke for quite some time, but we're going to share with you the portion about his own personal connection to quilts and the quilts that his grandmother made and the memories he has associated with those. Uh, the museum was kind enough to share audio of that remarks with us so that way we can share that with you and there's two ways to listen to this we'll talk about it a little bit more later but we also have done a video with this it's nothing fancy but you can see the quilts as we talk about them so that way you can kind of see what we're talking about um, as you hear it because these quilts are really powerful and at times are really actually uncomfortable to look at because they are really dealing with some very complex issues in our society today and throughout history and not just in the U.S. but across the world. There are quilts featured uh, from South African um, history and Canadian and Asia. I mean, it really deals with human rights issues across the world. So it's a great exhibit. I really hope you enjoy it. And we're going to include the coupon code for you guys uh, to use over at shop.quiltaddictsanonymous.com first, because this is kind of a long, weighty episode. So we want to make sure that you get that coupon code first. And that code is SO33. And you can use that to get 25% off any one regular price item. So if you've had your eye on a kit that's kind of expensive and you want it, we still have some Tulip Pink Wayfinder. Um, this is a great uh, opportunity to use that. So that is SO33. Go ahead and use that and get 25% off any one regular price item. Also happening over at shop.quiltaddictsanonymous.com, we are re-releasing additional rounds of our block of the month. So for the month of October, you can sign up to do the light or dark burst block of the month. It's a six month block of the month. Uh, so it's not a full year commitment. So it's really, it's a nice size quilt though. It's about 72 inches square. And then there's alternate instructions where you can make it a little bit bigger if you want something a tad bit larger. And then also we have opened up signups for Kaleidoscope again. So the way it works is you have to sign up in the month of October and then we start shipping everything in November. That way everyone's on the same schedule. It makes it a lot easier for us from a logistical standpoint. But it's really affordable. All you do is you pay a $25 sign-up fee, which covers the cost of your book. Normally, that's $30 to actually save five bucks. And then after that, it's $24.99 plus shipping to get that out to you. So you can make a really large quilt. Kaleidoscope is a king-size quilt, and you can make it for $25 a month. So check that out, and let's get to the interviews. Well, I'm here with Laura McDowell Hopper at the Pick Museum of Anthropology on the Northern Illinois University campus. It's about an hour and a half drive from where I'm located at. So I took this as a great opportunity to have a little bit of a road trip 
visit yeah. with Laura, who's been on the podcast before, and we've become friends. Then. Yeah. And I get to see this amazing exhibit, Quilts and Human Rights, and get a private tour with Laura. So, <laughs> Laura, introduce yourself. Tell folks a little bit more about this exhibit. Great. Um, yeah, I'm the curator here at the Pig Museum, and so uh, that means I have a lot of jobs, but one of them uh, is that I get to bring really great exhibits like Quilts and Human Rights to our museum. Um, this exhibit was really a perfect fit for our museum here for a lot of reasons. Um, one of them is that we always try and incorporate social justice themes into all of our exhibits. Um, it really sort of resonates on a college campus where students are really engaged in activist issues. Um, but we also have a collection of textiles from all over the world, about over 20% of our collection is textiles, 1,200 textiles uh, that we preserve and exhibit. And so um, bringing these quilts that are all about human rights themes to our museum was sort of the perfect fit for us. And this interview structure is going to be a little different than ones yeah. we've done in the past <laughs> because we're actually going to be walking around the exhibit and looking at it as um, we are talking about it. So if you are listening on a podcast, that's great. You can definitely do that and get a lot from it. But if you want to see the exhibit, number one, you can come. Yes, so it's free. Let's say the dates. Yes, it's open uh, now until February 24th, 2018. So you have plenty of time. Uh, we aren't too far from Chicago. Take you know, hour and a half or so to uh, get out to us if you're planning any trips to Chicago anytime soon. Um, and the museum is free. We uh, we do tours if you are in a guild or you have a shop and you want to bring your customers or your guild friends out here, your sewing bee, uh, you can just get in touch with us on our website. And if you can't do that, if you can't make yes. it out here, um, Laura's <laughs> going to get me some pictures of some of the quilts that we talk about. It won't be everyone in the exhibit, but we're going to create a YouTube video of this audio. It's not going to be fancy, <laughs> but you will be able to actually see a picture of the quilt that we're talking about as we talk about it. Mm -hmm. So it'll be kind of like getting a virtual tour. Yeah. Of course you should come see it if you can. Yeah, there's a big difference in uh, seeing these quilts in real life versus seeing a picture. Of course, seeing a picture is better than not seeing it at all, but a lot of the quilts I just... Uh, was surprised by when I hung them up on the walls just from seeing their pictures before. They were pretty different when they came here. All right. <laughs> so Laura has kind of given me a little bit of a preview uh, before we did this interview so that I kind of know where we're going. <laughs> and, uh, you know, if you're someone who just likes to turn off the TV news, maybe now is a good time to stop <laughs> the podcast and come back next week. Yes. Um, but if you are really engaged with what's going on today mm -hmm. in the world, this is a good one to listen to mm -hmm. because it shows how mostly women yes. have made these, um, have used their voice to speak through fiber. Mm -hmm. And mm -hmm. so we talk about, I mean, it basically hits on every single touchy point that's been in the news. Yeah. So yeah. if... If that's not your cup of tea, don't worry. We're going to go back to our regular quilty stuff <laughs> next week. Um, but if it is, go ahead and continue listening in. And yeah. We're good to go. So that's absolutely. a disclaimer. Yeah. <laughs> I know that not everybody wants to hear this. They just want to talk about, you know, patterns and quilting yeah. techniques. And, Which is fun, too. And, and I'm fine. a quilter, so I get it. Yeah. yeah. <laughs> um, but today we're going to look at this because it's it's really cool. It's almost in my backyard. Yes. And yeah. You know, it's a really good chance to see how women express themselves. Through it is. Well, and just sort of on that note, while well, we're still doing an intro, right? Um, that's a really important point that, that you brought up, Stephanie, that like the exhibit shows women expressing themselves through fiber. There were not a lot of other avenues for women to express themselves mm -hmm. in the United States for a long time or globally for a long time. So a lot of the quotes that are in this exhibit these quotes don't just come from the United States, they come from all over the world. Um, and you know, these are women who maybe still don't have the right to vote, don't have a lot of political agency. Um, and since textiles are just primarily women's work in most places of the world, this is how people are often able to express themselves. Absolutely. So it's really important. And we've touched on that in a few of our previous episodes too, when we've looked mm -hmm. at you know, quilting throughout history. So yeah. that's neat. Great. So the first section we're in is about our Perthtaid in yeah. South Africa. I hope I said that right. Yeah, yeah. Sometimes I pronounce things horribly wrong, and then I'm like, oh, shoot. Uh, so you have a couple of favorites in this section. Let's I talk do. about it. I do, yeah, yeah. The whole, um, the whole first area is just great. It honors champions of human rights. And so a lot of the quilts 
come from South Africa or are inspired by things that happened in South Africa. And the, um, I should have said in the introduction that this exhibit is partially a traveling exhibit from the Michigan State University Museum. So 28 of the quilts here uh, come from the Michigan State University Museum, which is home to the Quilt Index, home to the Women of Color Quilters Network collection donated recently by Carolyn Maslumi. Um, so, you know, it's an incredible museum that's doing some of the best quilt work in the country. Um, and then we added 15 quilts to bring the exhibit up to the present day, right? So a lot of these South African quilts come from the Michigan State University Museum because they have a really strong connection with South Africa. That museum has a sister museum in South Africa and MSU has, as an institution has been involved in a lot of research there. So, um, you know, we have two quilts that I really love in this section. The first is called Mr. Mandela. It's actually by a quilter from Michigan. Beverly Ann White, and I like her a lot because she makes portrait quilts that are just incredible. I can't do portrait quilts. Neither can I. It's too hard. It's too hard. How does she get his face so perfectly, right? But And she's doing it with a solid fabric. Yeah. It's not like she's hand dyed this in some mm -hmm. way or found the perfect fabric. It's it's basically embroidery yeah, to I'm create the lines and creases of the face. But you know just who it is when you look at oh, it. Yeah. yeah. <laughs> um, I really like her style. Uh, she has two quilts in the exhibit and both of them are portrait quilts and she's put little ties on the suits of people and I just think that it's such a clever uh, Clever thing for a quilter to do. It gives the quilt a little more dimension. Uh, but it's just a lovely quilt, and she made it really to celebrate Nelson Mandela, who, of course, was imprisoned for so long, um, had this long walk to freedom, as it's called, to be released, and then was able to enact so many changes in South Africa. Um, you know, after, for those of you who aren't familiar with what apartheid was, because I work at a college and I work with 18 year olds, <laughs> I know. They're, they're studying these things. They're just learning these things, right? But this was a very uh, severe and extreme kind of uh, government sponsored institutionalized racism where black South Africans were discriminated against, they were kept separate, um, and uh, white South Africans were given all kinds of privileges in the country. Um, and so, you know, it, was, it, it wasn't just like, you know, the Jim Crow South, which was horrible in the United States, right? This was, you would, could get sent to a labor camp for doing basically nothing wrong but being black, right? And uh, Nelson Mandela had to break stones at a prison for like 27 years, <laughs> you know? Mm -hmm. um, so it was a really big deal when he, uh, when he got released from prison. And we also have a quote right across from it that's one of my favorites in the show. That, this one is from South Africa. Uh, and it's called, it's a long title, South African Black Women Anti-Apartheid Leaders. And so I like this, one, because it's another amazing portrait quilt. Um, it's really, it's really well done. The, the quilter has, you know, put texture in people's hair by using corduroy. She's made little earrings out of buttons mm -hmm. <laughs> on some of the portraits. Um, but the whole quilt's like a black-based quilt, and it's just all women who were engaged in anti-apartheid work. Um, starts with the most famous woman, arguably Winnie Mandela, who is Nelson Mandela's wife. Um, but one of the reasons that I like this quilt is because I haven't heard of a lot of these people. And so it's an opportunity for me to read the names that are on the quilt and learn more myself mm -hmm. about apartheid. I don't, I don't know too much about it because I haven't done research in South Africa. So it's inspiring me to learn more. Yeah. Absolutely. Yeah, that's a great one. So as we go through this section, there's one other really great one that um, I like to point out on tours, and it is called Fearless. Um, some of you might have heard of it, or maybe you'll be reminded when it's you see the book. picture. Yes, yes. It's been in a book. It was part of a Women of Color Quilters Network exhibit that Carolyn Maslumi did um, several years ago. It was right after the uh, election and inauguration of Barack Obama. So every quilt in this exhibit celebrated Barack Obama's presidency, his historic presidency. Um, and so what this quilter, Sherry Shine, did is she took a really famous picture of Rosa Parks, who we all know 
mm -hmm. was one of the people who sparked the civil rights movement. She refused to give up her seat on the bus, right? Um, she was supposed to go to the back. She said, no, I'm tired. <laughs> I'm going to stay in the front. Um, and there's a very famous picture of her where um, she's sitting on the bus. She's looking out the window. And in the seat behind her, there's a white man. And, uh, you know, he's looking in the opposite direction. He's seated very comfortably in the area where he's supposed to be. Um, and what this quilter did is she replaced that man with Barack Obama. So he's still seated in the same position, um, but you can tell right when you look at it, she's just done a beautiful job. It's fabric painting mm -hmm. that she's quilted over, and it's just a, I wish I could paint like this. <laughs> you know? Yeah. It's gorgeous. You can tell right who it is. I just marvel at these portraits in the exhibit. Um, but it's a really amazing statement, right, about Rosa Parks and how she uh, was the first person to give up her seat on this bus, and Barack Obama was the first person, uh, African American person, to become president, right? Mm -hmm. And so, um, you know, having them together in this quilt is just uh, really, really powerful. Usually, when I explain this on a tour and I show the photo to people, um, I use my cell phone, just pull up the picture and pass it around. Um, people are really moved by this idea. Mm -hmm. Yeah, it's a good one. And it's just technically one of the best ones in the show, oh, too. Yeah. So let me move into a few other issues. Yeah. Um, there's two that deal with assault on women. Yes, yeah. Um, there are a lot of, uh, you know, of course, almost every quilt in the exhibit was made by a woman. Um, there's only one, actually, that was made by a man, which we're going to talk about later. Um, and they deal with a lot of issues and a lot of intersections with issue, you know, things that, that women deal with in their lives, right? Um, but this quilt that we're looking at right now, this has been at QuiltCon, so some of you may have seen it before. It's also been at IQF. Uh, it's by a quilter named Jennifer Benoit Bryan. And I would argue that it's been the one quilt in the exhibit that everyone has talked about as they've left the, the museum. Mm -hmm. um, everybody is connected to this exhibit, uh, this quilt. Um, usually on a tour, we have to stop and let people come and look at it more closely. Um, it's really stayed with people. Um, and this quilt came out of the maker's personal experience with assault. Yes, yeah. So, um, you know, in, in her artist statement, um, Jennifer Benoit Bryan, she explains that uh, after, after she had been assaulted, she felt kind of powerless and she felt like she was labeled uh, as a, a victim. And so there's two words that are on the quilt, right? There's victim and you can hardly see it. Yeah, it's it's pieced, for those of you listening and, mm -hmm. and not watching on YouTube, it's pieced, but it's pieced with hues of fabric that are almost really close to the background, which mm -hmm. the background is red. So it's um, different shades of red and orange with just a tiny bit of white in there. Mm -hmm. um, and so it's very, it's, it's very, very hard to read. Yeah, you can't. Yeah. But the other word, survivor. It's is all white. Yes, all and white. And capital letters. And capital letters. And victim letters. is lowercase. Yes. And so it's very easy to read survivor. And so she talks about how, in her artist statement, she talks about how when she had the opportunity to testify against her attacker, um, she says, I'm reading it directly from her right now, it propelled me even further along in her journey um, to become a survivor. Uh, she says, this quote represents my transition between these identities, and I hope, it off I hope it offers hope to others who are working their way along this path. And so I was saying to Stephanie earlier, I think one of the reasons that this is just staying with people and sort of becoming an audience favorite so far is that, you know, I think all of us at some point in our lives, something has happened to us that has made us feel victimized, mm -hmm. made us feel like we don't necessarily have control of ourselves or our circumstances and that we want to move forward and become a survivor. And so there's something about this quilt that's got a lot of power and really stays with people mm -hmm. in this exhibit. And there's another one that mm -hmm. deals with this. Yes. And it's the only quilt that isn't hung. Yes. It's on a bed. Mm -hmm. And we were discussing, you know, the importance of this in general, but also specifically on a college campus, mm -hmm. where I think you said this, the latest stats were that one in four women who attend college are going to become the victim of sexual assault. Yes. So which it's is something just that's on people's minds. It scares me. I have a three-year-old daughter. And, mm -hmm. 
oh, I don't want to think about it. Right. And so, yeah, it's important. It's an important conversation to have, like Stephanie said, especially on a campus where people need to learn about issues um, surrounding consent and mm -hmm. surrounding, you know, sort of appropriate behavior. Um, this is a quote by Sean Kimber, who uh, I think a lot of us are fans are. I'm a big fan mm -hmm. of her work. Um, it's called Todd's No Baby Baby Quilt. And so in case you forgot, I know you didn't. Nobody forgot this. <laughs> in 2012, um, Todd Egan, who was a politician from Missouri, gave an interview on TV where he said um, that women can't get pregnant if they are the victim of a legitimate rape. And science will tell us otherwise. <laughs> right. Of course, that's not true. You know, <laughs> we can't just shut things down. You know, that's not how that, bodies that work. That would be nice. <laughs> right. <laughs> yes. If you didn't have to worry about that as well. It would. It would. Um, but we do. This is the reality in which we live. And to have somebody, you know, go on TV and say something that is just so badly informed and so dangerous to like victim advocates and victims themselves. Um, you know, when women have a hard enough time being believed when they're assaulted, mm -hmm. um, that was a big deal. And so, uh, you know, Sean was inspired to make this. It's a quilt. It says legit rape here. And, you know, she said that what she sort of wanted it's to like do. It's like in a box. Yes, in like the middle. It's, it's mm -hmm. like a beige box, mm -hmm. and inside of that beige box is a maroon background with the words legit rape here. Yes. And uh, to me, it looks really powerful on a bed because, I mean, when you obviously it could happen anywhere, but you envision right. it on a college campus being on a bed somewhere. Sure, maybe and like a dorm room or, yeah, yeah. And so it really, um, it has a lot of a lot of power on this bed, right? You know, Sean wants to sort of spark conversations with people, um, with viewers of this quilt about what legitimate rape could possibly mean. You know, of course any rape is a legitimate rape. It's something, you know, mm -hmm. we shouldn't be questioning survivors, right? Um, but putting it on the bed, you know, that was that was what she told me she wanted. Um, I saw her at QuiltCon mm -hmm. uh, this past year in Savannah, and uh, I, at that point, I knew that she was sending me this quilt for this mm -hmm. exhibit. I knew it was getting loaned to me. And uh, this quilt was in the show, and it was on the wall. And Sean and I were standing in front of it. We're talking about it. And she said, you know, uh, it's never been on a bed before. Mm -hmm. And I said, well, I can put it. I can put it on a bed in mm -hmm. my exhibit. Um, and then I worked with her a little bit to make sure that it looked the way that she wanted it to, um, you know, because I had set it up. Uh, on a bed that was way too small <laughs> for it before. Um, but, you know, what we landed on really has started a lot of these kinds of positive conversations on our campus, these conversations about consent and about um, campus sexual assaults. Mm -hmm. And so it's it's already, you know, we've only been open for two weeks, but it's already uh, sparked a lot of good conversations. Good. Yeah. So. Uh, we're going to walk over to sort of a, a new section of the exhibit now. Um, there's a, a section of the exhibit that is about uh, human rights issues that affect large amounts of people, right? So collective transgressions mm -hmm. against human rights. And, uh, you know, the quote that Stephanie and I are standing in front of right now, it's called Los Desconocidos. Um, and I'm not a Spanish language speaker, so I don't think I would do forgive me. Yes, <laughs> um, but it's a really. This is another quilt that has a huge amount of power. I mean, basically everything. <laughs> We're looking at. Um, yeah, I can't even tell how many skulls. Lots of skulls. It is. Uh, each of which represents someone who was found in the desert. Yep, trying to cross into the United States. In just one part of the desert, um, just in the one Tucson year. sector, right? yep, 2012, 2013. Um, so this is an organization called the Migrant Quilt Project. And since the year 2000, they have made one quilt each year that is memorializing people who have passed away, just, just trying to get to the United States. Um, and you know, a lot of the ways that we talk about migration, uh, sort of, they, they really minimize a lot of the reasons that people are making this really, really dangerous journey through, the, through a desert where they know that they could die because the desert is a very dangerous place to be. Um, you know, a lot of people are trying to escape some of the most violent countries in the world in Central America. Um, and so, you know, it's, 
it's a difficult decision for people to have to make to try and come to the United States. And some people, a lot of people, don't make it, as you can see. There's, I believe there's over 300 skulls on this quilt. I can't remember the number off the top of my head. Um, but it is made out of denim that was found in the desert, mm -hmm. um, denim that was worn by some of these people. You can see holes and wear uh, patterns in the denim. Um, and uh, you know, a lot of these people, you can't identify them because they don't have identification mm -hmm. on them when they make the journey. So uh, des conocidos, that means um, the unknown. So some of these skulls, they do have a name above them. But most of them, you can see, most of them say desconocido or desconocida over the top of them because many of these people can't even be identified. And she was telling me when we did our sort of pre-interview walkthrough mm -hmm. that, you know, there's also images of violence on here too. There's gunshots yes. and, and if they have the cause of death, they have it. And one of them has a gunshot by it and it says cause of death, gunshot wound to the torso. So mm -hmm. it's not just succumbing to the heat, it's also... Yes. It's also, yes, it's also, it's just very dangerous. You know, you have to put a lot of trust into uh, people who, you know, might just want to steal your money or um, do bad things to you. Uh, and so, you know, to think about these types of things that people go through to try and get to this country, the decision that they've made is that it's safer for them to make this kind of dangerous journey than to stay in their home. Yeah. You know, so this isn't, this isn't about economic migration, right? It's not always about getting a, a better job. This is about, I'm probably safer making a journey walking through a desert where I might die than staying at my home. And that's a hard thing to think about. I'm sure. Yeah. Absolutely. Yeah. It stayed with a lot of people. Our campus has a lot of um, undocumented students. And so, uh, you know, we have a sponsorship program for all of the quilts people signed up to sponsor and uh, choose a quilt and donated some money to help us get this exhibit here. And this quote was um, sponsored for Dream Action NIU, which is our undocumented student organization. Mm -hmm. so, really meaningful. So the next one I know you're a bit concerned <gasps> about. So <laughs> yes. the exhibit opened, what did you say, two weeks after Charlottesville? Yeah, two or three weeks after Charlottesville happened. Which made this quilt become much more yeah. Touchy. Yes, and, yes. And I suppose a word for it. <laughs> yeah. Um, Probably not the best word. <laughs> well, I was explaining, I was, I was telling Stephanie that we decided to book this exhibit in um, November of 2016. So we've been planning this exhibit for a very long time. Um, and the quote that Stephanie and I are looking at right now, you'll, you'll know right away why I got worried about it. Um, it's called Southern Heritage, Southern Shame. It's by a quilter named Gwendolyn Maggie. And it is a picture of a Confederate flag and overlaid on that with organza are silhouettes of lynching victims and a silhouette of a clan hood. Mm -hmm. And, uh, you know, so I told her, I was watching the news, I was watching what happened in Charlottesville, and the whole time I did it, I was thinking about this quilt. And I thought, you know, I it never, of course, never crossed my mind to take this out of the exhibit. That would be mm -hmm. very inappropriate um, because this is, the, the quilt, it was made in 2001. Uh, Gwendolyn Maggie is a, a resident of Mississippi. Mm -hmm. um, she's passed away now, but when she used to live in Mississippi. Uh, and she made this in response to the failure of a referendum to remove the Confederate flag as the state flag of Mississippi. Mm -hmm. um, her whole body of work it deals with imagery that's sort of like the lasting effects of slavery mm -hmm. and institutionalized racism in this country. Um, so this is sort of not an unusual piece in, her, in her, her, yes, in her canon. And I would never think of, I would never dream of censoring an exhibit that mm -hmm. way. Um, but, you know, I watched it and I thought, oh goodness, you know, I, I'm so, I got so worried that people would come in here and they would get upset or, you know, try and like tear it off the wall or do who knows, who knows what, or sort of make our staff uncomfortable. Um, but you know, that was, you always sort of think worst case scenario yeah. when you're well, planning you events, to. right? <laughs> you know? With an exhibit like this, you yes. have to think, well, what's the worst thing that could what's happen? What's the worst thing that could happen? Yeah. And the best things that could happen is what happened. Mm -hmm. um, so what people have told me, um, you know, the, the people at the exhibit opening who were uh, stationed around this quilt told me that everybody was really 
glad that this was here and that they were really uh, moved by it and that they overheard conversations about people, uh, you know, between people asking, well, what are your opinions about Confederate monuments or about the Confederate flag? Mm -hmm. And so it was doing its job. It was making people talk about this and have a conversation. Um, about something that is hard to talk is, about. Yes, it's hard to talk about, um, and that. Because you don't know like where the safe boundary is mm -hmm. anymore. Mm -hmm. I felt like at one point there was one, but right. I feel like it, anymore there isn't. Well, yeah, and I mean, you know, especially when you see one of the things that a lot of people talked about after Charlottesville happened is that you know this this has a Klan hood on it, right? But we saw people carrying Confederate flags. They did not have yeah. a hood on, right? So people are not hiding themselves anymore, um, you know. And it's it's just it's hard. Uh, it's hard to think about. We need to think about it. We all need to talk mm -hmm. about it. We need to learn from each other uh, about you know how we can acknowledge this history, how we can move forward, mm -hmm. how we can actually correctly uh, memorialize it. And one of the interesting things, you know, you and I didn't talk about this before, but just popped in my mind. A lot of folks, um, you know, that I saw, I was really watching a lot of news when Charlottesville happened. Sure. Yeah, um, but uh, a lot of folks were s sort of repeating a talking point where they would say, you know, we need to take down these Confederate statues, which, you know, we don't have to get into personal stuff too much, but which I agree with. Um, we need to take down Confederate statues. This stuff belongs in a museum. And so I, I thought that it was interesting that even sort of political commentators were seeing that museums are the place where you can have mm -hmm. a conversation like this and where you can learn from. History. From history, yes. And you can sort of grow and heal and. I mean, it happened. It's part of our yeah. country's, mm -hmm. why we are the way we are today. Mm -hmm. And. Yeah. I mean, it informs a lot of where we're at. Yeah. And I, you know, I just, I think that as this exhibit goes on, I am interested to see how our students interact with this. I'm interested to see what kind of creative comments we get on tours uh, mm -hmm. going forward and sort of learn what kind of solutions people on our campus think we should have to mm -hmm. uh, Confederate monuments. Yeah. And then right next to it, it sort of gets back into how racial relations are still yeah. very much problematic today yes. in our society. Yes. So With Angry Young Men is next. Yes. And this is, um, this is one of my favorite ones in the show. I mean, I could say that about all of these, honestly. <laughs> but, um, this is by Marion Coleman, who's a quote maker some of you might have heard of. She's well known. Um, and I, I watched a video of Marion Coleman um, explaining this. And so it's, it's on YouTube and you can see her, maybe we can link to it. Yeah. You can see her talk about this quilt herself. But what she says is um, she spent some time working as a, a social worker and she was very frustrated by what's sometimes called the school to prison pipeline. So this idea that we are spending more money, more effort in this country on incarcerating young black men than on educating young black men. Um, and so she, uh, the, the quilt itself is, it's a series of photo transfers, um, a lot of photo transfers, and most of them are of the same young black man, man um, and he is posing as if he's being arrested. And it's actually her son in these yeah. pictures. Um, she asked him to uh, pose for these photos, which to me, I feel like that would just be the hardest thing to do, to mm -hmm. look at your child's posed like this. Yeah. Um, you know, he's an adult in these images, um, but that I, I, I still, I just can't imagine. I can't imagine doing that. Um, and then she's also, one of the things that I, I like about what she's done is there's no binding on this quilt. It's the only quilt in the whole show that doesn't have a binding on it. And in, in her video interview, she doesn't talk about why she didn't bind it. Uh, but I sort of think, uh, it, it might symbolize the sort of raw feelings. You know, we call it the raw edge of mm -hmm. a quilt, right? So symbolizes how raw the feelings are about this issue. Absolutely. Yeah. Okay. So now we have to walk a little bit. Yeah, we, we do. <laughs> we do, which is um, uh, sort of the, the technique of this one is really incredible. So uh, if you're listening, it's make called sure She to look. Carries Her House. Yes, She Carries Her House. It is a um, turtle at the bottom of it. Um, and a turtle shell is a turtle's house, 
right? Um, everywhere they walk, they can decide to sort of take a break, set their shell down, pull all their limbs in, take a, take a nap, Mm -hmm. <laughs> do whatever turtles do in their shells, mm -hmm. right? Um, so it's a sense of security that, that turtles have at all times. Um, and so this turtle, uh, which is lovely, it has these really cute little shell toes. I know, I, I didn't <laughs> notice that the first time around. Yeah. It's cowrie shells, it's yeah. toes. And it's, um, it's dimensional, there's like a little ruffle on its shell. Yeah, for its like little... The little bottom part yeah. of the shell, yeah. Like it's, it looks like it has like the armor of a turtle shell on it. Mm -hmm, mm -hmm. It's just lovely, and but behind it, it's contrasted. It's another photo transfer, and what's behind it are these papers that Black South Africans had to carry with them at all times when um, the uh, under apartheid in South Africa. Um, so uh, this statement says all non-whites had to carry a passbook, which included their photograph and a statement of whether they were Indian, black, or mixed race. Failure to produce a passbook on demand often led to harassment, torture, and imprisonment. So, you know, it was a very serious thing to have these papers with you, but they sort of dictated where you could go. Mm -hmm. They dictated your boundaries, um, and people could question you at any time. Um, there was also a system of housing segregation, which is what this speaks to. You can see there's a couple little houses on the quilt that are around the um, photo transfer of the paperwork that you had to carry. Uh, so, you know, it sort of symbolizes this idea that you never really had a secure place to be when mm -hmm. you were a black South African under apartheid, um, contrasting with this turtle that always had a safe place to be. It's also sort of... Um, like a dual message too, where the turtle always had to be ready to move. Yeah. You know, and so, so did black South Africans. Absolutely. Yeah. So the next one is about an issue in Canada that was just 30 years ago. Yes. So sometimes we talk about things that, you know, you think of rights, human rights issues being something in the past, mm -hmm. but we're still very much dealing with it today, obviously, and, mm -hmm. and around the world in yes. a very recent past. Yeah, so this is, you know, again, ugh, this is one of my favorites <laughs> in the exhibit. Um, it is by an indigenous Canadian quilt maker, Alice Olson Williams, and it's about something called the Oka Crisis, which I have found that not a lot of Americans know about, because mm -hmm. this is Canadian history we're talking about now. Um, so in, um, I can't remember if it was 1990, yeah, 1990, um, there was an event called the Oka Crisis, which was in a town called Oka. And in that town, there was a nine hole golf course and there was a Mohawk reservation. And the people who golfed at the nine hole golf course wanted it to be an 18 hole golf course. And so their idea was they would just go across a little two lane highway and cut down all the trees mm -hmm. that were across the street. Well, those trees were incredibly important to the Mohawk people that lived there. Um, these were sacred trees where a lot of spiritual, um, uh, spiritual rituals happened. Um, some of the last of a certain type of species of tree grew, grew in that area as mm -hmm. well. Um, and so it was really, a uh, really big deal that that land be protected. These are also, you know, keep in mind this is 1990, right? You know, we think we're done with <laughs> sovereignty issues, but you know, if you're not paying attention to news from Indian country, you know, you can you can miss all of this, right? And mm -hmm. um, this was very recent. Uh, so what ended up happening is they just said no. They said no. You are not going to encroach on our land anymore. This is, you know, we all have to remember when we think about tribal activism that uh, you know indigenous folks have been. <laughs> trying to retain and reclaim their land for centuries, yeah. you know? And so this was just the last straw. And so the Mohawk folks there built a, a small fence, a little barricade around that land. But the Canadian provincial police, you know, boy, they escalated things. They didn't mm -hmm. handle things well. They brought in tanks. They brought in helicopters. They brought in machine guns. Um, and all kinds of weapons of war and things that were very threatening, whereas you know, Mohawk folks were trying to stage a peaceful demonstration. We all saw this if we were paying attention to the Dakota Access Pipeline mm -hmm. uh, demonstrations that were for uh, you know, water protection. 
So, um, you know, what you see in the quilt is there's a big tree in the middle. It's called Tree of Peace Saves the Earth, right? So there's a big tree in the middle. It's what they're trying to protect. But around it, there's all these gray things that look like machines, and there's they, they, they're like surrounding the tree. Yeah, like they're all they're like attacking it. it. Yeah, some of them are right on the tree or in the tree even. Um, you know, and they look like the tanks. They look like the helicopters um, that were you know trying to threaten mm -hmm. the people who were on the, the reservation. Um, this standoff between the Mohawk folks that were behind their fence and the armed Canadian police lasted for 78 days. Mm -hmm. So 78 days, they tried to protect their land. Um, luckily, nobody, uh, as far as I know, from what I've read, nobody was injured um, or hurt in any way. But uh, at the end, the, uh, the Mohawk folks won. They were able to retain their land. Um, it's protected land mm -hmm. now that they can use. Um, I don't know what happened to the golf course. <laughs> I haven't read about that, but I also don't, I don't care. Know. Yeah. <laughs> it seems like a footnote. Yes. <laughs> it's more important to me that, you know, that we got this, uh, we have this quilt that, that celebrates this really important uh, activism that's about sovereign, tribal sovereignty, really, mm -hmm. what it boils down to. Yeah. Um, so, you know, in this same section, yes. we're sort of in an area right now that's about specific events mm -hmm. in time. So that mo that Oka crisis, that happened at one event. Uh, at, well, I mean, it was a very long mm -hmm. event, but uh, that was... That a was, specific time in history. Exactly, exactly. Um, so another one, which is <laughs> broken record, uh, one of my favorites. <laughs> <laughs> She's only talking about her favorites. <laughs> yes. Which Probably every quote we could talk about, and you would say that. But yeah, I think so. <laughs> but this one works. But there's like my favorites and then my favorites. Okay. <laughs> right? So this is this is one of my favorites. Um, it's by Eric the Quilter. Some of you might follow his blog. This is really a simple design. It's very simple. It's just one block. Yeah. It's block based. Um, it's a bunch of equal signs. Which is, you know, a lot of times you'll see on Facebook where you can mm -hmm. put that over your face to support. Um, LGBTQ, and mm -hmm. that's a symbol that it is here in many different colors. Yeah, so many different colors. I, you know, okay, Stephanie knows me well enough to know that colors sort of stress me out. A I, little bit. <laughs> yeah, I'm wearing only black and white <laughs> right now. Sometimes you mix in a very deep, like, purple <laughs> yes. or blue, yeah, but I, I haven't do. seen anything beyond that. <laughs> I do, yeah. <laughs> you know, I think if you, if you look at my own quotes, too, you'll, you'll be able to tell the colors for really freaked me out, right? Um, so I really admire <laughs> Eric the Quilter because when you look at this, um, you know, and if he listens to this, I hope he knows I mean this in the best possible way, but this reminds me a lot of old uh, Nickelodeon cartoons mm -hmm. from the 90s, which are just my favorite things. Laura uh, and I are the same age, so yes. <laughs> we share this in common. I would say if you're around our age, um, yes. my, I would describe my design aesthetic as Rocco's Modern Life. <laughs> <laughs> so, you know, this is, I love it because, you know, it's a lot of like orange and blue, green and red, and it just is so colorful and it's this great celebration. So it's all of these equal signs that initially when, uh, when Eric made this, he made it for a lesbian couple who he knew and it was before the Supreme Court decision, um, federal decision to uh, legalize gay marriage in this country. So he made all of these equal signs on this big quilt for his friends to tell them that their marriage was just as good as anybody else's mm -hmm. marriage. Um, and he made a, a replica version of it for the MSU Museum after they, after they saw his quilt. It's just incredible. And this one's from right here in DeKalb. Right here in DeKalb, yeah. yeah. It happens everywhere. <laughs> yes, we're all around, right? There's well, 20 we, million we of us. We have a little bit of a quilt scandal that we're going to talk about here. This is a scandal, so, yes. You know, whenever I remember reading the um, Elm Creek Quilters, book series. Oh, okay. And there I was one that. of them where there was this huge like mm -hmm. riff in a guild oh, and like the it just didn't go well between like the local guild and the Elm Creek quilters. And I'm like, this is <laughs> like this is just pure fiction. <laughs> and then like immediately, like a month later, there was something similar that happened to my guild. I'm like, no it's not. You put women together and eventually something is gonna happen. <laughs> and you would think it wouldn't, like that we yeah. were just here to have fun and celebrate quilting. Yeah. But, sometimes but sometimes there's some quilt scandals. Yes. 
yes. And yes. this is one. Yes. I'll say, you know, I, I am a proud Chicago Myron Quilt Guild member. I love my guild so deeply. And I think a lot of us share this feeling. It's like our communities are so wonderful, yeah. right? And so when something like the story I'm about to tell happens, it can just be so painful oh, and yes. so hurtful. Because these people are like a second family. They're your family. That you mm -hmm. are with at at these meetings Absolutely. and you've known for years. And yeah. So I can't imagine being in this quilter's shoes. Yeah, so uh, so local quilter, um, her name is Diane Johns. Um, she made a quilt uh, that is called the L Word. And it basically just has a, a lot of words yes. that are used to describe lesbians. Yes. Which she is. Yes, yes. Um, and you know, Diane said that she, she never, Lived not, her life. Not all inflammatory. Hidden. No, 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 no. You know. And you know, I would argue, and I think you would agree, and, and a lot of people would that you know. It's just slang. It's slang, yeah. And I think inflammatory is about your perspective. Yeah. You know, and I would consider. I'm going to say it. I'm just going to say it. <laughs> if you have kids in the room, just pause it. Earmuffs or something. There is the word dyke, and I would consider that to be the worst word on there. I yes. think everything else is perfectly fine. It literally acceptable. just says a lesbian right next to it. It's just yeah. a normal word. It so, says femme. Like it that's says the one yeah. I see it, and I'm like, yeah, I can see people being offended by that. Um, but even you but know, everything it, else is, is just yes. I think it's perfectly fine. Totally, totally. And it's very text based. So yeah. when you see the picture of it, there's lots of text on it. And um, uh, Diane herself uh, had a career as an editor. And mm -hmm. so that is why she has a lot of text in her uh, like in literally her Scrabble text. Scrabble tiles. Yeah, yeah, it's kind of cool. There's Scrabble tiles. There's those little, you know, things you used to make on a bracelet that had your name, those little beads that yeah. had letters on them. I'm sure I had those at some point. <laughs> yeah, I had those for sure. Um, there's, you know, photo transfers of famous quotes and things like that. Um, and there's like a power in sort of reclaiming some of the language, too. And so I, I just think it's, you know, she's made something wonderful. It's so colorful, too. It it's is. really fun to look at. So, you know, she makes this quilt. Her work isn't... It's not huge. It's, it's like maybe like two by two. It's 25 um, by 25. 25 by 25, yeah. It's a little quilt. Um, and, you know, her work doesn't sort of center around this part of her identity. This is sort of the first time she's made a quilt like this. Um, and she uh, submits it to a guild show, a local guild show. And their submission process, this was a while ago, um, their submission process was you print out a four by six picture of your quilt and you send it in. And you know, guild shows are so great and fun and positive and usually, you know, everybody gets, everybody gets it. It's just showing off your work, right? Um, so she, she got accepted. Of course, her work is lovely. It would get accepted in lots of places like our museum. <laughs> um, but, you know, she, uh, she gets in, she goes to drop her quilt off. Um, she gets a phone call and they say, uh, you have to come pick your quilt up. And they've decided that this quilt can't hang in their show uh, because it's too controversial mm -hmm. and children will be at this exhibit. Um, and, you know, one thing is, uh, Personally, I mean, this was made in 2004. I like to think we've all come, we've a, come really a really way long since way. Then. Yeah, since 2004. I mean, that's 13 years ago. 13 years, a lot of things have happened. Yeah. Um, you know, we just talked about that Supreme Court decision when yeah. we talked about the last quilt, right? So we've made a lot of forward progress, which is wonderful. But, um, you know, clearly, and of course, we still have a lot of work to do. But, um, you know, clearly in, in 2004, it was ideas were different. It was too much for for some people, right? And so she she tried to explain why she made the quilt and thought maybe people haven't heard some of these words before and sort of tried to uh, help people understand it. And they still said, "No, we're not hanging this." Um, what ended up happening, you know, even though I, honestly I can't I can't imagine how painful that kind of a rejection, rejection would be. Maybe. She was in this guild for 19 years. <laughs> you know, those are just your best friends yeah. who are saying, you know, this part of your identity we're not going to we're not going to support mm -hmm. this necessarily, right? 
So uh, a lot of other quilters heard about this. They pulled their quilts out of the show, and they made their own. <laughs> they made their own show called the Band Quilts Show, <laughs> that was held at a local Unitarian church, um, and tried to turn the negative into a positive. They charged admission to the Band Quilts Show. Um, they raised money for an organization called Youth Outlook, which is the only uh, organization for queer youth in the five counties surrounding Chicago. Um, so you know they sort of were able to turn that negative into positive. Mm -hmm. The quilt later caused a big stir too because the L word was featured in a, a quilt magazine uh, along with a bunch of other quilts in an article titled Controversial Quilts. Mm -hmm. And then Joanne Fabrics decided not to carry that issue I of that, that magazine. <laughs> there was also yeah. a Viagra quilt yeah. mm -hmm. in that one. Yeah. I remember getting that email alert. <laughs> yes. <laughs> I'm like, okay. <laughs> <laughs> really? I mean, like it's <laughs> like you have to put it in like a like a black plastic wrapper or something. I mean, it's just a quilt like, magazine, know. you know. Well, and it's like, actually like with the Viagra quilt. I'm like, <laughs> okay, is this in your medicine cabinet at home? It right. maybe is. <laughs> yes. I mean, <laughs> that's fine. A, yeah. a lot of men yeah. use it. Yeah, yeah. <laughs> I don't know so. why it's. it's <laughs> anyway. But you know, little little like homegrown uh, quilt controversy, I know. right? There's, it's so sad when it happens, but it does. It is, yeah, it is. So this one is kind of the hallmark, like when you walk in, you mm -hmm. see it immediately. Yes. Um, the one for Eric G. And yes. this is hung at QuiltCon and, mm -hmm. and a few other places. And mm -hmm. this one's really powerful. Um, if you're familiar with the YouTube video, it's someone actually saying, I can't breathe, as yes. someone's holding him down. Yes. Um, and he suffocates and dies. Yeah. And, and so it, that's ugh. just in text again and again until mm -hmm. it, like, breaks apart. Yes. Like, the words get a little further apart as it goes down. And they and get a little darker, too. And into blues. And yeah. Um, yeah. It's the, really, a, it's sad, but powerful. Yes. Yeah. And the, that, that sort of encapsulates what you just said, encapsulates the, the whole sort of center of the exhibit. Um, this section there is called Quilts of Memorial. Mm -hmm. And so everything in the, the center of our exhibit space was made to memorialize or commemorate people who died as the result of a, a human rights mm -hmm. abuse or issue. Um, so, uh, so yeah, this one is by Sean Kimber, another one of her quilts. She has three quilts in the exhibit. Um, we talked about her uh, quilt that said legit rape here mm -hmm. a little bit ago. Um, but this piece, you know, this is, it's, it's really, it's really staying with people. Um, I'll say, you know, we had uh, Reverend Jesse Jackson at our exhibit opening, which was um, really wonderful. You know, if you uh, are familiar with his uh, presidential campaigns, he gave, he gave a speech in 1988 that was about quilts mm -hmm. when he was at the DNC. Um, he talked sort of about similar things while he was here. He talked about how his grandmother quilted and how quilts are this metaphor for unity and coming together and um, healing through, um, you know, something as warm and comforting as a quilt. Uh, and when he was here for the exhibit opening, I gave him uh, his own private tour of the exhibit, and he said that this was his favorite quilt. Mm -hmm. um, he said he had just seen Eric Gardner's mother a couple weeks before he was here, and that he wanted to send her pictures of this quilt. He took a lot of photos of himself with this and uh, said he was going to send her these photos, which, you know, I think uh, we were talking earlier, Stephanie and I, that it's just amazing that to think that, you know, Sean poured so much of herself into this and she spent so much time making this piece um, and she did it in her living room and now Jesse Jackson's going to send a picture oh <laughs> of this quilt to Eric Gardner's mother, you know, um, who can really see the power of, uh, of Sean's work. Um, this is another one too, where, you know, at the very beginning we were talking about the difference between seeing a picture of a quilt and seeing, seeing it, it in person. person. Mm -hmm. Um, you know, there's a lot of, I, I've seen, there's we've a lot all, that you picked up on that you pointed mm -hmm. out to me. Yeah. I've seen so many pictures of this quilt. We've all seen it, um, because it's so moving. Um, but one of the things that I was so hard to notice in the pictures is there's a lot of red hand quilting on this that I just, you can't see it when you step really far back. It's hard to see against the dark blacks and purples and blues that she's used um, in, uh, in the quilt. So it says I can't breathe, but a lot of it is a log cabin uh, square mm -hmm. block that's just all around it. Um, and they're all very dark. 
And the other detail that you pointed out that I thought was yes. really telling was that she used this juvenile print of yeah. a bunny. A bunny, yeah. And, and we're talking a lot about, you know, innocent youth and yeah and, and you know how that can this world and sort of shatter when you have to learn about things like this yeah and honestly you know I don't I'm not sure if what her I should ask her I'm not sure what her intention with the the bunny prince was but that's sort of how it reads to me um, that you know she chose this this bunny and you can't see it at all in the pictures you can't no. see the bunnies at you all you have to get close to it very to close it. yeah um, that yeah that maybe they're this this symbol of youth and this symbol of, of innocence sort of contrasting mm -hmm. with this symbol of death and police brutality and institutionalized racism, mm -hmm. like we've been talking about. Yeah. It's one to see in person, that's for sure. Yes, for sure. And then right behind it, we have a quote by Jackie Gearing um, called Aftermath. So both of these are hanging in the center of the room, mm -hmm. like Stephanie said. Um, Jackie made this quilt after the Boston Marathon bombing. So she, uh, she said that her husband is a runner, and so she knew people who were running in that marathon that day, and she said she just couldn't turn the news off. But the last thing she saw in the news before she went to sleep was this image of blood on the sidewalk. And she said it just haunted her. And she woke up the next day and knew that she needed to make something mm -hmm. about it. And so it just looks like it a looks big, like a blood splatter. Yeah. On white. Yep. On white. Yeah. And it's just a solid red on a solid white, just a blood splatter. Yeah. And you know, it's really, um, it's striking. It's hard to look at, um, but I think that it makes a really powerful kind of anti-violence statement. A lot of Jackie's social justice work, you know, she's really well known for her just amazing um, minimalist design mm -hmm. and abstract quilts that she makes that I just adore. But a lot of her uh, social justice work is rooted in anti-violence and rooted in trying to to heal and be more peaceful. And mm -hmm. I think that this really reminds you of what violence looks like. Mm -hmm. Yeah. Then the one of the last clips we're going to talk about is one that commemorates a school shooting here at Northern Illinois University's campus. Laura, you weren't mm -hmm. here yet, but mm -mm. at the time I was working um, in the newsroom at the Quad City Times, which is about an hour and a half away. So this was something we followed very closely and, and had very big on, on the paper yeah. because we have campuses within the Quad Cities as well. So mm -hmm. this really kind of hit close to home. And I just really remember that night of just being in the newsroom and watching the developments. And I wasn't that far out of college myself at that oh, point. Yeah. So it was really mm -hmm. like a, it hit home to me. I know that. Mm -hmm. um, but this quote was made to commemorate that. Yeah. So and you were saying that it actually happened right where we're standing. Yeah, it did. Yeah. Um, so, you know, it has a lot of extra weight to it because of that. Um, so, th yeah, this happened in, in 2008. Um, Stephanie's right. I, I was not working here yet. It was my first year of grad school. But I had just moved to Chicago. Um, so I do remember mm -hmm. when it happened because I, you know, I didn't know yet where DeKalb was. I didn't know how far away this was from where I was at grad school. So I was worried, too. Um, but uh, so, yeah, 2008, um, the building that Stephanie and I are in, are in right now is called Cole Hall. And uh, prior to 2008, this building just had two really big lecture halls in it, two big auditoriums that saw, sat hundreds of students each. Um, so uh, w one morning, it was actually it was Valentine's Day, um, 2008, there was a student who was troubled and came into the lecture hall and just sort of indiscriminately shot into the room. Mm -hmm. um, five students were killed that day. 19 students were injured that day. Um, and it's really, there's like a lasting legacy of this pain mm -hmm. on campus. It really wasn't that long ago. Um, mm -hmm. We're only just about to come up on the 10th anniversary of this, which I'll talk about in just a second. Um, but you know, after, after that happened, they decided this didn't, no one wanted this to look like a lecture hall anymore, so they moved our museum exhibit space over here, so our sort of gallery space, so that it could be open to the public, it could be a place where people could come if they needed to come here and remember people. Um, and so, you know, we always sort of remember that uh, at, at our museum when we're doing exhibits. Um, this legacy, this sort of like, 
architectural memory that mm -hmm. we have in this building. So in 2008, after the shooting happened, the library on campus led a memorial quilt project, and they invited anybody who wanted to to make a quilt square that commemorated the lives of the, the five students that were lost that day. So you can see that repeated a lot. There's five flowers in one of these. There's mm -hmm. five names over there. Um, this one that has five names also has symbolism um, for the uh, 19 students that were uh, mm -hmm. injured that day. Um, there's also patches that commemorate the first responders mm -hmm. that came. Um, it wasn't just our campus police that responded to this incident. It was um, regional police, state police. It was kind of, my understanding is it was just sort of everyone mm -hmm. uh, came here. So, um, you know, it's, it's meaningful that this is here in the space where it happened. Um, it's also painful that yeah, it's here I'm in sure. the space where it happened. Because I'm sure there are still many people who were here that day. Yes, yeah, and you know, I, I was telling Stephanie before we uh, started recording that there's still people who almost 10 years later are uncomfortable coming back into this building because they have so much sort of pain and remembering uh, the, the lives that, that were lost that day, yeah. Uh, so, you know, one of the things that we're going to do um, Throughout this semester, our museum is starting a 10th anniversary memorial quilt project um, because there's this sort of lasting legacy and memory mm -hmm. of violence here um, and trauma here. So it's gonna be a complement to this quilt that was made in 2008. Um, in February 2018, the university is going to be having a series of commemorative events, and we're going to, we're planning to unveil this community quilt as one of the, uh, one of the events, mm -hmm. yeah. And there's a couple more that are part of the museum's collection here. Yeah, yeah. And this speaks to, you know, we're not just talking about, you know, things that are going on in the U.S. It's, yeah. it's history across the world, really. Yeah, which is, you know, uh, one of the things that is so incredible and meaningful about this exhibit, right? It's not just um, things that happened in our backyard, which is very meaningful and powerful, but well, this looks and globally. Sometimes it makes you just want to, like, just turn off your phone alert <laughs> and turn off the news because it's like I've had enough. Yes. Every every minute, no matter no matter what side you're on, I feel yeah, like. it gets, can get overwhelming. Like it's, it's overwhelming. There's yeah. always something, and it just gets really frustrating. So to know that. You know, we're not the only ones who are trying to figure mm -hmm. this out. Right. Yeah, you that's know, true. This is a global issue. Yeah. I also think it's it's helpful. Um, it's helpful to think about these issues that we're talking about in relation to quilts and textiles too, because it is this sort of comforting material. It's an object type that we have the most intimate relationship with. Mm -hmm. These are things that you can imagine on your bed, like warming you at night. And so, thinking about. Um, this object of comfort in terms of, you know, helping you to understand something mm -hmm. that's very difficult, I think is, I certainly prefer thinking about things this way I, I than prefer, watching yeah. a press conference these days. Yeah. <laughs> but, uh, that's true. Yeah. Um, you know, of course I have to do both. I have to make time for both. But, um, but yeah, this, uh, these two quilts are from our museum's collection uh, that I talked about at the beginning. We have 1,200 textiles from around the world. Um, and some of the textiles in our own collection deal with human rights issues. A lot of our collection comes from Southeast Asia. So these two textiles are about two very different experiences during the Vietnam War um, from a Southeast Asian perspective. So the first one, it's called a story cloth. It's made, uh, it's a very famous type of textile made by Hmong people who are an ethnic minority group that live in different areas of Southeast Asia, usually high up in mountains. So it's not really confined necessarily to one mm -hmm. country, right? Um, but a lot of Hmong people lived in Laos, um, high up in the mountains. And during the Vietnam War, they sided with the United States. Um, they wanted to, uh, they, they didn't like the, uh, communism that was sort of overtaking the region. And so uh, they partnered with the United States um, to, you know, try and defeat that. And when, of course, you know, we all know what happened at the end of that war that was not successful. Um, and so when the United States 
left Laos, um, a lot of Hmong people were targeted by Lao communists, Patet Lao, um, who, you know, targeted them for uh, maybe sort of re-education campaigns or um, even sort of torture or death. It was a very, very dangerous time to be a Hmong person. And so they ended up having to become refugees. They were forced out of their country. And you can see it's all embroidered. Mm -hmm. It's a big, long blue textile with a, a pieced border around it and then an embroidery panel in the center. And it seems so, like, not what you would expect to mm -hmm. see beautiful embroidery yes. of soldiers with guns pointing at people's backs to get mm -hmm. them to move. Yes. Like, yeah. you, that's not what you expect to see in embroidery. Mm -hmm. And I think it, you know, we, we sort of touched on this as we went along, but, uh, you know, it speaks to... It speaks to sort of the the pain and trauma and ubiquitousness of this sort of behavior in people's lives, right? Like people who have it easy sometimes will embroider flowers and it's pretty, or <laughs> they'll embroider anything, mm -hmm. you know, because they think it's really beautiful. But um, f you know, for Hmong people, this this was the reality of their lives. They were being forced out of the country to become refugees, um, and a lot of people have never been back since yeah. they were forced out. Um, and yeah, it's just. And this was a way that someone could express their feelings about that. Yeah, it was also a way to document it because mm -hmm. for a very long time, and this textile is about this specifically for a very long time, um, you know, and really even today, uh, this history is unacknowledged, you know, um, in, in Laos, right? Mm -hmm. So they don't really want people to know that this happened, that there was this violent campaign against Hmong people. Um, this textile uh, was actually, it was from DeKalb. Uh, from right in our town. It hung in an office on our campus, and one day the woman who had this in her office was hosting some government officials from Laos, and this was in the 80s, not mm -hmm. too long after the Vietnam War. And one of the government officials got you know, incensed when he saw this and uh, went through the textile pointing at different images and saying, here, this is a lie, that is a lie, all of these things are lies, and actually tried to get the name of the artist from the professor who had this in her office oh, wow. because, yeah, because he said, you know, she's a traitor. The person who made this is a traitor and these are lies. So this was like an act of documentation. It was an act of defiance. Of course, the... That's a man, like crazy <laughs> to think yeah. that embroidered textile could yeah. get someone labeled a traitor. Right. <laughs> yeah. It's sort of the the power of, uh, of these textiles, but also the... <laughs> At least the power here we of people can make being it. afraid, right? Like, yeah. You know the, the Confederate flag one that yes. became so worrisome after the events of Charlottesville. Yes. At least here, you just have to worry. Okay, what are people going to think about it? Yes. You don't have to worry that someone's going to get labeled a traitor. Yes. And they're going to try and like round you up. Yes. For making at, at it. At least we we have that. Yeah. We have freedom of expression. Yeah. And for all the <laughs> you know difficulties we have, you know. Yeah and being so divided, at least we can say what we feel. Right, without No matter being what it is. Mm -hmm. Mm -hmm. Yeah. yeah, so yeah, very, very scary time. Um, the other textile that's right next to it from our collection, it is um, from Laos, but there's a difference between Lao people and Hmong people, right? Mm -hmm. So uh, Hmong people are not they live in Laos, but they are not Lao people, mm -hmm. right? Um, they are their own ethnic minority group, right? So the other the other textile is by somebody from Laos, and um, uh, I just noticed a typo on the label <laughs> while we're talking about it. Um, so I'm gonna have to reprint that. <laughs> but, uh, okay. Yeah, it's from the 1970s. It's actually kind of funny. Yeah. <laughs> so uh, we'll get you back on. Track I know. Yet. I'm it's so distracted good. by it. Oh gosh. So uh, yeah, it's from the 1970s, right? So it's from around the same period of time, right? And a lot of people don't know quite how devastated Laos got um, after the, the Vietnam War. So it is the most heavily bombed country in the world. Um, I did some math based on uh, how much, uh, how many bombs were dropped there. And so to understand the scale, if you spend an hour in our museum looking at this exhibit, we've been talking for about an hour. It is. You can imagine seven and a half plane loads, plane loads of bombs being dropped on Laos, in Laos. 
Um, one of the problems with these types of bombs, you know, don't picture like a big bomb. <laughs> like you're, what you need to picture is like the size of a softball, like a small mm -hmm. circle. Um, and one of the, the lasting problems in Laos is that not all of these bombs exploded when they were dropped. And so there are still um, millions of unexploded bombs just laying on the ground in Laos. Um, and because they look like a softball, oftentimes the people who are injured or killed are, are kids. kids. Yep, they think it's to a toy. Mm -hmm. To this day. Oh they goodness. think it's a toy, they pick it up, it goes off, you might lose an arm. You're probably if, lucky yeah. if you lose an arm. Um, so, you know, it, it remains a dangerous place to be, and it is all because of what happened during the Vietnam War, right? Um, a lot of people haven't heard about that. One of the things that's incredible about this textile is that you have to look really, really close, but when you do, you can see uh, that it, it's a weaving. It's, um, it's black, it's got red and yellow stripes on it. Um, when you look really close, you can see that in the black bands, there are pictures of helicopters, there are pictures of machine guns, there are pictures of um, airplanes that would carry these bombs. So there's, they have woven into this textile these weapons of war that have had such a lasting devastating effect. Yes, in this country, yeah. And so, you know, it's a, it's an interesting one. It makes you look at it for, for a little while until you understand it, yeah. So we've talked about how if you can, you should see this in person. Yes. <laughs> if you can't, you know, the closest thing we can get is, is gonna be that YouTube video where we'll put up images of the quilts that we're talking about mm -hmm. as we're talking about them. Yes. Um, and I think you have some audio of when I guess. Jackson was here. We'll, we'll add it next. Okay. It is going to be a very long podcast. It is. So if this you're is gonna something love you're it. really into, <laughs> uh, great. If not, you know, it's okay. Uh, it's all right if you don't make it to the end. Um, <laughs> but it'll be worth it. It will. Yeah. <laughs> I was so bummed. I was so sick. I taught at a guild, and I, I picked up something that just, like, knocked me down oh, for, like, no. two whole weeks. So I wasn't able to come to the opening when he was here and hear the remarks in person. So I'm excited to hear the audio that, that Laura has captured. Yeah, it and was And we'll be able incredible. to share that with you. There was mm -hmm. a section that she mentioned where um, he specifically spoke about quilts and, mm -hmm. and how that affects us as a society. Yeah. I can speak. <laughs> We've been talking for an hour. I need, yeah. I need to just be silent <laughs> for a little while. We all do sometimes. So yeah. what, what is your biggest takeaway um, as a curator oh. of this exhibit? Because I know yeah. that, that you added a lot and you, mm -hmm. you pulled a lot of quilts that are relevant to today. Yeah. Um, and obviously there are many quilts that we did not talk about yeah. because we're already at over an hour just talking about the, the ones that are, are really powerful. So mm -hmm. what's your takeaway as a curator? That's a, oh, that's a great question. No one's asked me that in all the interviews I've done. So good work. Well, thank you. <laughs> yeah. Good to know I still have those journalism skills yeah. somewhere. Still got your chops, just right? A little. <laughs> yeah. Um, you know, I think one of the things that I have talked about before is that, um, you know, a lot of us, we love going to quilt exhibits. Um, I will go anywhere to see a quilt on a wall, mm -hmm. <laughs> you know, as a quilter myself. It's so important to me, uh, but also like as a historian who understands the importance of these objects. Um, but in putting this exhibit up, I've been doing a lot of reflecting about the types of quilt exhibits I've seen at other museums. And it is not often that you can go into a museum and see an exhibit where most of the quilts were made by women of color, mm -hmm. where the quilts come from all over the world, Southeast Asia, South Africa, all over. There's a quilt from Haiti that we didn't talk about mm -hmm. um, in this show. There's Canadian indigenous quilt. Um, you know, it's just not, it's just not often that, mm -hmm. uh, you know, quilters are sort of all given a level playing field to sort of amplify their voices, right? So it's just, I've been very proud to have such a diverse group of quilters in this exhibit. I've been real, and not even just, you know, diverse in their backgrounds, but in thought and mm -hmm. in idea and in technique. Um, it's really, you know, the Michigan State University Museum does just incredible work and I admire them to the moon. I just want to 
be there. <laughs> you know, I want to be those curators in my life. Um, and you know, I think that we should uh, we should support this type of exhibit as much as we can. We want to make sure that we're showing in numbers that we want to see exhibits that are this Even diverse. Even though it does, I mean, some of these quilts really do make you uncomfortable. Sure, and they're and meant they're supposed to. to. Mm -hmm. Mm -hmm. You know, and I think you know, I think that that's another good thing because. One of the things, I, I just love our visitors at this museum. Mm -hmm. Our visitors here are, uh, you know, this isn't our first rodeo. All our exhibits are about social justice issues. Um, and we're always like, oh gosh, somebody's gonna come in and it'll be horrible, and it never happens. People come in and they have inspiring conversations and they exchange ideas about difficult topics and they come up with their own solutions to problems. And sometimes people are inspired to go donate to an organization or go you know, join a student group that is about one of the advocacy issues in, this, in our exhibits, and that's so amazing. It's really incredible. Mm -hmm. Yeah. Absolutely. Well, thank you for spending your afternoon with me. <laughs> oh, I'd do it anytime. Yes. And <laughs> we will, next we'll listen to Reverend Jesse Jackson, an excerpt from his speech at the yes. opening of this exhibit. <laughs> Thanks so much again. Thank you. As I've looked at the quilt uh, exposition today, I thought about my first acquaintance with the quilt, my grandmother had aspirations hide in her means. I remember one Christmas she had to get some, she knew some clothes from my brother and I, and she borrowed $11 and had to pay back 35. But it didn't bother her, she wanted her sons to have something. She wanted us to have matching socks. So we would not go to school and be embarrassed. She paid the price. The next year, she and a group of her friends were just as illiterate in a functional sense, a former William Workers Club. They would save 50 cents a dollar, 25 cents a week. The next Christmas, they had enough money not to have to borrow anything. They, 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 they picked up broken pieces and made something with it. They made something out of broken pieces. And I remember having thought about that, how she would, uh, when the winter time would come, and my father put up paper at the walls, not necessarily even paper, it was not the decoration of the paper for a windbreaker. We called it wallpaper. It really was a windbreaker for us. And she couldn't afford to buy uh, a blanket, a piece of uncut cloth. She would get old shirts and overalls and sheets, dresses, rayon, cotton, nylon, whatever she could find. And she would cut them up, put them on the bed, wash them out. And while they were on the bed, however silk a piece may have been, a rayon, a nylon, a cotton may have been, while they were part, they were just rags, Mr. Mayor, they were just rags. But then she would connect them with a strong cord. And it was rags, dysfunctional apart, became a quilt, a thing of beauty and art and culture, a source of warmth. No matter what our beauty may be, when we are apart, we are like it under those rags. We just, nothing really matters because whatever we are, it ain't enough to cover the rest of us. So she would connect us and she would make, make a quilt, a thing of art, a thing of beauty. But to put it another way, we, we did not know how good baseball could be until everybody could play. And the more I look at the, the quilt, she would have these odd pieces. Every piece fits somewhere. She did not have the politics of you didn't fit because of your color, or your texture. Every piece fits somewhere, hooked by the cord. And sometimes that's a metaphor for the great society. Everybody fit somewhere. You don't know where the talent may come from. You don't know what child may have in his or her mind the cure for cancer. You don't know who may have in their mind the, the skill, the endowment to make us safer from asthma, a black coal lung disease, black lung from coal miners. 
because God distributes talent. He does it all over town. And that's the genius of the quilt is, is creativity. You do, you do not know where the creativity is coming from. It's born of your own experience. And, and thus, as many experiences as there are people. And so I want to thank the, the, the quilters for sharing some of their, their life with us. Thank you so much for listening to episode 33 of Sit and Sew Radio, a Quilt Addicts Anonymous podcast. Don't forget to go over to shop.quiltaddictsanonymous.com so you can use your coupon code SO33 to save 25% off any one regular price item. You can use that on some of our really big kits that are kind of pricey or just, you know, a yard of fabric, a big fabric bundle, whatever you want. It all works. So go check that out and thanks for listening. (music) 